In the centuries which have passed since he lived and worked, Masamune's skills as a master craftsman have granted him almost mythical status. He was the most famous swordsmith of medieval Japan, perhaps of all time. His skills are appreciated most of all by today's master sword makers, who know how much skill is required to produce the perfect blade. Can the centuries-old skills of Masamune be recreated today? By watching a sword take shape through each extraordinary stage of the forging process, we can reveal what made Masamune the supreme master. And by learning how his swords were used, how they could spell instant death, we will understand why they were prized above all by the samurai who wielded them. Masamune's Japan in the late 13th century was a land where fighting skills were of vital importance. Just across the Sea of Japan, a huge Mongol army was poised, ready to strike. The Mongols at that time under Kublai Khan had sent uh, emissaries to uh, Japan, uh, demanding tribute, in fact. And the, the Japanese had treated them rather harshly, um, beheading several of them and sending their heads back. So, of course, the, the Mongols were not too happy with that. In 1274, the Mongols invaded, ravaging large areas of Western Japan, before a storm known ever since as the Kamikaze, or Divine Wind, wrecked the invasion fleet and saved the nation. We can be certain that, along with all Japanese, Masamune would have offered thanks to the gods. I was born in a time of great conflict. When I was 11 years old, the barbarian invaders made their first attempt to conquer our sacred land. But with the help of divine wind, they were defeated. When I was 18 years old, the invaders returned. And once again, they were forced to retreat. But we could not be certain when they would try again. At Kamakura, just south of Tokyo, and now the site of the world-famous giant Buddha, Japan's finest sword makers worked around the clock. At this time in Kamakura, the forges of the swordsmiths glowed day and night. At all times, the sound of hammer on steel rang throughout the district. I became the pupil of the great master Shintogo Kunimitsu, founder of the school known as Sagami. It is from him that I learned many secrets of the swordsmith art. The young swordsmith realized he could turn the traditional cavalry sword, the long, thin tachi, into a much more fearsome weapon, the model for samurai swords ever since. During the Heian era, 1,000 to uh, 1,100 years ago, swords were very elegant looking, and uh, kisaki, uh, or cutting tip, was smaller. Then the Mongol invasion took place, and the Japanese samurai must use their sword cutting Mongolian leather yoroi, which is armor. The point on the Japanese sword became longer, and the earlier curvature on the sword was based nearer the hilt, which is known as koshizori. The tendency then changed that the curvature moved more towards the middle of the blade, in what is called torizori, giving a much more even curve. And this is far, this is far better, far more suitable for fighting from foot than horseback. Cutting the armor was much easier. And uh, Masamune contributed that shape and uh, also the uh, function. To slice through thick leather, his swords had to cut like a razor. They still do, 
after a polishing and sharpening process lasting 10 days. Tameshigiri or test cutting was performed on a live prisoner. And a prisoner was tied sometimes or they were hanged by the uh, hook. Uh, then the uh, uh, body was cut by the sword. And there is a certain area, uh, the body or the neck or a certain area was used for test cutting. Real tameshigiri is used on the live body. We are not uh, allowed to do uh, those uh, barbarian act. Therefore, we use a, a replacement. Since we cannot use the uh, live body, cutting bamboo is a resemble to cutting vertebrae of our human body. In order to cut the bamboo, uh, you study long time to make a precision cut. You require the precision distance and uh, timing and also the strength of your arm. Hey! It has to be fresh bamboo, green bamboo. This resembles to the flesh of the human. The creation of every true samurai sword begins in the same way, with a process developed even before the time of Masamune. The method of smelting devised in ancient times has changed little over the centuries. The steel traditionally used for sword making is smelted from a black sand called satetsu, naturally eroded from iron ore bearing rock and recovered from stream beds. Smelting takes place in a trough known as a tatara, built from clay, a new one for each smelting cycle, which lasts five whole days. Once the fire is lit, over a period of 72 hours, successive layers of oak and pine charcoal are mingled with the iron sand. The tatara is tended constantly by the smelting master, using a bellows to maintain just the right conditions for the now molten iron to be transformed into steel. In temperatures reaching 1500 degrees centigrade, molecules from the charcoal combine with the molten iron to produce a carbon-rich and therefore very hard metal, the steel known as tamahagane. On the fifth day, the clay trough is pulled apart, revealing the white-hot steel block. In each smelting, from 21 tons of ore and charcoal, roughly one ton of steel is produced. Once cooled, the block will be broken into fist-sized pieces, each enough to make a sword, though at this stage, the metal is still riddled with impurities. Masamune's skill lay in actually using those impurities to his own advantage, creating a finished blade that combined elements both brittle and pliable. It's what made him a master 700 years ago. But who are the masters who follow in his footsteps today? One of the greatest of them is Yoshimitsu Ono, a winner four times over of Japan's National Sword Contest, where the finest swordsmiths enter a single blade for judgment. To be a swordsmith at all in Japan requires a government license, issued only after an apprenticeship of at least five years. The dedication of the apprentice is tested in an extraordinary way. For the first of those years, he will typically do nothing but chop charcoal into the exact shape and size prescribed by the master. It's a way of instilling discipline, but a uniform size for the charcoal pieces also ensures a steady heat during the crucial stages of forging. First, the master needs fire. He can make it almost by magic 
as Masamune would have done. With the friction of rapid striking, the tip of this slender iron rod becomes red hot. Enough to light a taper of rice paper and bring the forge to life. Now the master selects the first of the pieces of raw steel, which he will coax, almost sculpt, into a work of art. The master controls the temperature of the furnace with a bellows, uniquely designed to blow air both on the inward and outward stroke, ensuring a steady heat. It's the master who dictates the whole complex process which is to follow, while a more senior apprentice wields the hammer according to his directions. The first stage of forging is designed to even out the distribution of carbon in the raw steel to produce a metal of uniform hardness. Once the steel has been hammered flat, it's quenched in water and the brittle slab is broken into small pieces. What follows is like mixing the ingredients in a recipe, but since these ingredients are unyielding metal, it has to be achieved in a remarkable way. The master's experienced eye tells him how to mingle carbon-rich fragments with others in exactly the right proportion. Then follows something which really does look more like the work of a chef than a swordsmith. The pile of fragments is wrapped in wet paper. A little rice straw is sprinkled on top before the whole package is doused with silicon clay. The wrapping and clay coating are there to bind the pile of fragments together and also to prevent the metal itself from burning as the furnace temperature is raised to around 1300 degrees centigrade. Masamune used no thermometer, and neither does the modern master. He knows by long experience just when his steel sandwich is ready to be hammered once again to fuse the layers together. Once he's satisfied with the basic mix of his steel, the master begins the process of creating a complex, layered structure within the metal. It's done by repeated flattening and folding. The steel is folded six times in one direction, then another six times the other way, and so on. You fold it back over across itself. You've got immediately two layers. Do it again, you've got 4, 8, 16, 32, 64. If you fold it 10 times, you've got a 1,000 layers. You're effectively creating a kind of mesh. And mesh, as we know, is a terribly, terribly strong formation. There are certain stages of the forging process which it is absolutely crucial to get right. One of the most important of all is this layering of the steel. If this isn't done correctly, if at this point the metal is damaged, perhaps being cut in the wrong place, then the billet of steel is discarded. We would have to start again. As each folding operation has doubled the number of layers, by the time the metal billet is ready for second stage forging, it will contain upwards of 30,000 individual layers, fused together by heat and hammering, giving the sword enormous strength, but also, once the layers are revealed by polishing, enormous beauty. It's one of the ironies of the samurai sword that an object accorded such spiritual power, prized by the connoisseur, is essentially a tool for killing, if not now, then certainly in Masamune's time. My swords and daggers have been called beautiful. 
Some people have called them works of art. I'm glad if they appear beautiful, but that is not why they were created. A perfectly balanced sword forged from the finest steel from which all flaws have been removed is the most effective weapon. The most finely tempered blade is also the hardest and sharpest. The true beauty of my sword is demonstrated not in the palace, nor in the temple, but on the battlefield. The most familiar samurai sword is the gracefully curved katana. They were often individually tailored to the height and strength of a customer. But also special forms were made for special tasks. This is a tachi. Uh, tachi means a sword with a deeper curvature. And how you hold it is this way, or sometimes one hand, two hands. Ryote and a katate. And uh, two hands are used for leverage. This is a tachi about a thousand years ago made. This tachi was used by the cavalry soldier from the horseback riding. Now I want to show you the katana, which is a shorter and a less curvature. And the katana normal length is about 27, 28 inches long. The cutting motion is this way. And the blocking. And the jabbing. And this was used uh, foot soldier or samurai since uh, shorter and much easier to uh, use. This short sword is called wakizashi and uh, approximately 450 years old. And one side is a katakiri hazukuri, which has an edge. And the other side is a hirazukuri, flat made. Often used by the bandit and uh, pirate. And the one hand is used often while he's shooting the Tanegashima musket gun or grabbing some object, uh, much easier to use. This dagger is called Tanto, and used by the uh, foot soldier against the uh, whole soldier who fell on the ground. Uh, first, Todome Waza is done, uh, fatal stab, then followed by the decapitation. And uh, sometimes uh, this is used for harakiri, for the samurai himself. The tanto is a good weapon. Of the few dozen surviving blades believed to have been forged by Masamune himself, most of them are daggers, or tanto. This is one of them, a priceless treasure held at the Hayashibara Museum in Okayama. But what distinguishes blades of the great masters from all the rest? It takes an expert eye to judge. The answer? lies almost at microscopic level. Steel, which to the untrained eye all looks much the same, contains barely visible particles which give a clue to its composition and the skill of the smith who forged it. The key characteristic unique to the samurai sword is what's called the hamon, the gently flowing pattern just behind the cutting edge. It proves that the blade has been correctly tempered, but it's also where the swordsmith becomes a true artist, creating his own signature patterns. 
Some are said to resemble clouds. Others, the petals of a flower. It's that which makes the blade of a master worth more than its weight in gold. And so cleaning this 700-year-old Masamune blade is something which also requires the skill of a master. Careful never to touch the blade with his fingers, the swordsmith removes the habaki, the metal collar which secures the blade in its scabbard. Then he carefully applies a powder called uchigomori, made from stone, pulverized almost to dust. The powder acts as the gentlest possible abrasive to remove any traces of rust which may have developed from airborne moisture. Finally, to protect the blade until it's next examined, the smith applies a thin coating of oil, tsubaki. The swordsmith treats the tanto not just with professional care, but a kind of reverence, a clue to the mystique surrounding the master, Masamune. But how easy is it to tell his blades from the others? At London's Victoria and Albert Museum, they have a sword which may or may not be the work of the great master. It's been at the museum for almost a century. Masamune blades are nowadays hardly ever auctioned. Its value, if it were, around half a million pounds. Although it bears Masamune's name, sword dealers and appraisers began faking his signature three centuries ago. I think sometimes you have to go with a gut reaction. And the more that I look at this blade, the more that I see that's going on there, the incredible beauty within the steel, the subtlety, the, the grain of the flat of the blade, the, what's happening within the harmon itself. It couldn't be made by anyone else than a real master, and the only real master at that time was in fact Masamune. So yes, I mean, I would, I would probably going out on a limb on this one um, to say that it's by Masamune, but I, f I feel it is. Although the hamon created by Masamune have inspired almost poetic descriptions, they were put there for a reason. The broad hamon, the tempered edge, which is a hallmark of my blades, means that if the blade is damaged or chipped in combat, the sword can be reground. This would not be possible if the damage extended into the softer area of steel behind Hamon. Here is an example where something that is considered beautiful, the broad Hamon, is in fact a practical solution to solve the problem of restoring a damaged sword. The Hamon is the clearest sign of the swordsmith's skill. Modern fakes like this one try to simulate the undulating, tempering line, but it's the work of a machine, not a master. And the material is inferior metal used for the uh, making of the car, automobile, something like that. The samurai demanded the very highest quality in a sword because quite simply, in battle, his life depended on it. Even in modern day Japan, now the land of big business and the bullet train, the image of the samurai is still highly potent. Movies continue to celebrate these free-spirited warriors. A set of these seven samurai models in a Tokyo store will cost you 1,000 US dollars. Business leaders study the samurai code of discipline, loyalty and courage. <laughs> I think that sometimes, in the West, you have a wrong idea about the samurai, almost as if they were gunmen, outlaws. It wasn't like that. A very important part of the philosophy that goes with the samurai sword is that it could just as well remain in its scabbard. It doesn't have to be used. Then, it's a symbol of concealed or latent strength. 
あのシンボルみたいなもんであったわけなんで。Samurai enjoyed a privileged status. Imagine not the crowded streets of modern Tokyo, but ancient Edo, where it could mean death to even touch a samurai. Let's say samurai walking in the street, and the townsmen or farmers or a civilian touch their scabbard, even、uh, they were samurai were allowed to cut them. On the spot. o t e u c h i or instant execution. And samurai is not punished. And this was done until late 1860s, not too long ago. It was、uh, approximately 140 years ago. This kind of practice was done by the samurai. Here, as nowhere else in the world, the sword is treated with a respect close to worship. As a gift from the gods. In one of the great Shinto legends, the storm god Susano, brother of the sun goddess, is called to do battle with a fire breathing serpent. Eventually, he slays the beast and discovers inside one of its eight tails a magical sword known as Kusanagi. Still today, the Kusanagi remains one of the three items of imperial regalia, the nation's crown jewels. The sword and the skills it takes to produce it have long been revered in Japan. Though within living memory, those skills came close to being wiped out. In 1945, as the Allies celebrated victory, much of Japan lay in ruins. On the 2nd of September, aboard the battleship USS Missouri, General Douglas MacArthur presided over the ceremony of surrender. I now invite the representatives of the Emperor of Japan to sign the instrument of surrender at the places indicated. Let us pray that peace. Be now restored to the world, and that God will preserve it always. These proceedings are closed. Immediately after the signing, the Americans issued an extraordinary decree. On occupation, it was a law that every sword had to be surrendered. Um, because they were regarded both as weapons, but perhaps m- even more than that is the fact that the sword is one of the three symbols of the emperor the mirror, the jewel, and the sword.、Um, so the sword was inextricably linked with、uh, Japanese imperialism. So the sword was completely and totally banned. All swords had to be surrendered.、Um, they were gathered up, they were taken away in trucks, they were taken away to be melted down into. Cutlery, Mitsubishi Company apparently had them taken away. I would also say that, of course, not all swords were surrendered、um, uh, as, as part of these edicts issued by the Americans. M- the many, many famous swords were, were locked away because people were aware of what happened to them. Post war Japan turned its back on all things military. Sword making was banned until 1953. And after that, only allowed with a strict limit on how many blades each smith can produce. By law, swordsmiths are limited to producing two swords per month. But you have to bear in mind that for every sword that I complete to the final polishing stage, I will discard probably five blades that have not turned out as well as I wished. The limit on sword production ensures that there can be no mass production, though it's difficult to see how the complex and lengthy process could be hurried. This section, through a blade, shows how two very different types of metal are used. The paler outer jacket is hard, carbon rich steel, which can be sharpened like a razor. The dark inner core is softer metal, 
to absorb the shock of impact to prevent the blade snapping. To achieve this, the smith must fuse together two pieces of steel with just the right carbon content. He starts by beating what will be the outside of the blade, including the cutting edge, into a rough U-shape. At this stage, the sword is still no more than this lump of metal. The iron bar it's attached to is merely the handle the smith needs to work with. A billet of lower carbon steel, the core of the blade, has been shaped ready to fit inside the jacket. Once again, liquid clay is used to prevent the steel burning. Now the composite bar is brought almost to white heat and the master hammers the steel to fuse both elements together. It's from this point on, with the smith satisfied that he's created the correct layering and variations of carbon content in the steel block that the sword will begin to take shape. The blade is drawn out to roughly the length that's required. And then the first crude cutting tip, the kisaki, will be marked out with a few swift blows with a chisel. Now, for the first time, something like a sword slowly begins to appear. Blow by blow, the smith starts to flatten the steel bar, producing what will be the curved cutting edge. But he's careful not to make it too curved at this stage. Once the blade has been hammered into a recognizable sword shape, there comes the most remarkable stage of this whole process, one where the master summons all his skill and experience to add his own distinct hallmark to the blade. To create the ham-on pattern near the cutting edge, the smith needs to once again alter the crystalline structure within the steel. To do that, the blade is carefully painted with a mixture of liquid clay and charcoal powder. It's a highly delicate operation. The master needs the mixture to be slightly thicker in some places than others. In the split second moment of quenching that's soon to follow, because of the insulating properties of the clay, those areas will cool fractionally slower than the others imprinting the ham-on pattern through the metal. This is the moment of truth, when the sword will be imparted both its look and its shape. Both the speed and the angle at which the sword is doused are critical. At the very instant of quenching, something remarkable is happening. Watch closely as the sword begins to bend. The hard and softer steels within have cooled at different speeds, causing internal tension, imparting exactly the curve the swordsmith was looking for. It's now almost ready to become a weapon in the hands of a master swordsman.
The correct way to use a samurai sword is governed by traditions every bit as old and rigorous as the method of making it. This is Ayado, the discipline of drawing, striking, and then sheathing the sword. What does it tell us about the mind of the samurai? Why is the sword always worn, curved side uppermost? That's the cutting edge. If it's on top, the samurai can draw and strike in one swift action. And at the end of each exercise, why does the swordmaster make this strange flourish? It's not just for show. In battle, that's how the samurai would shake the blood from his blade. If you put the sword back into the uh, scabbard with the blood on, you will have a rust inside. Rust is the worst enemy for the samurai sword. With blades that are razor sharp, little wonder that when two swordsmen practice their art, they give each other plenty of clearance. Often we use a bokken, uh, which means a wooden sword, at the beginning. After we have a skill developed, or uh, after a few years, we start using a uh, shinken, the live sword. There is the attacker and also the receiver or as a defense. Hey, yeah. And uh, this offensive and the defensive technique will teach you balance, timing, and uh, coordination. But there is something that offers some clue to the fury of samurai combat. Kendo, literally, the way of the sword, is the closest we now come to seeing samurai swords being wielded in anger. Instead of a blade, the combatants use a shinai made from bamboo. And though it looks fast and furious, Samurai combat training, Kenjutsu, was even more arduous. Kendo and the Kenjutsu are different. Kendo was established after the war, uh, but Kenjutsu exists before the war. Kendo is more like a sports oriented. Uh, many actual fighting methods were forbidden, uh, plus the uh, limited time was given to fight in the Kendo. However, Kenjutsu uh, training, we don't have a time limit. There is no judge even. One, two, one, two, three. You try to block. Try to do the same thing. Yeah. Over your okay. shoulder, over your shoulder. Clear it, clear, yeah, clear. Okay, do the katate uchi sushi, chokuzugi to the face. Yeah. Then the block into the side. Yeah. Our Kenjutsu style is a very similar to the live sword used in the battlefield. We fight sometimes half an hour to 45 minutes or even more. Until one gives up from exhaustion. Whoever survives is a winner. There's a final and critical stage in the process which has seen crude iron turned into a blade of the finest steel. It requires skills as old and highly valued as those of Masamune himself. It is in the forge that the sword is conceived, that its future character is determined. But it can be said that it is not until the polisher has done his work that the sword is truly born, that its nature is revealed. I have respectful skills of the sword polisher. 
he must understand just as well as I the potential of the steel, the hidden beauty which is there to be revealed. Sword polishing is a craft all of its own. Not even the finest swordsmith would attempt it himself. Okisata Fujishiro is a master in this field, the third generation of his family to follow the profession. When he first sees the sword, it's covered in fine scratches, and none of the tempering patterns is visible. It takes 10 days to polish a newly made sword, using no machines, just a succession of stones, the surface of each one a little smoother than the last. Once all hammer marks and scratches from the forging process have been completely removed, the precision work begins. For this, the polisher uses just the tiniest flakes of stone, At the next stage, he's using little more than his bare skin and a delicate paste of powdered stone and water. Now the vision of the swordsmith will finally be revealed, with the tempering pattern, the hamon, visible at last, exposing the soul of the blade. It's only when the blade is returned by the polisher that the swordsmith can inspect his own handiwork, can see whether the decisions he made in the darkened forge were the right ones. Swords from a master like Ono Yoshimitsu, purchased now by rich collectors or museums, can cost anything over $25,000. As one of the great modern masters, he says it's his duty to pass on his skills, teaching part of his time at a sword school. But even the teacher recognizes that neither he nor his pupils will ever quite match the genius of Masamune. There are many reasons for that. Masamune was working centuries ago. So we can't be exactly sure how he achieved what he did. Of course, techniques are passed on. But each time the knowledge is transferred from teacher to disciple, it changes, maybe ever so slightly. So we can never say for sure this is how he did it. I was taught many secrets during my apprenticeship and I have perhaps been able to add some useful techniques of my own. The techniques of the swordsmith have been developed over many hundreds of years to bring us to the present day. Will new secrets be discovered? Will new methods of forging be devised by the sons of my disciples? Or have we reached the limit of the sword master's art? These are questions which interest me greatly. Though, of course, I cannot answer them. <laughs>